Uh, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Barack Obama was elected president 10 years ago last night. His victory speech at Grant Park in Chicago in front of a quarter million people um, actually spanned the midnight hour. So that victory speech ended 10 years ago today. 10 years. And he, of course, was sworn into office in the midst of the collapse of the U.S. financial sector and the most rapid contraction of the U.S. economy since the Great Depression. And he and his brand new administration did what they could to try to stop the unfolding, the, the then unfolding worst economic disaster in a century. They weighed in directly to save the American audio, auto industry. And then with big Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate that had been elected alongside President Obama, they started a long, 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 laborious process of trying to bring about the first reform of the American health care system since Medicare and Medicaid were created generations ago. From almost the outset, they took off the table the most progressive options for doing that because they were trying as hard as they could to make it a bipartisan bill. They spent probably a year more than they otherwise needed to trying to accommodate Republicans, to get Republicans on board. But all Republicans said no. And then in the very end, Democrats passed it anyway. And conservative media and the Republicans decided they would then preach all day long, every single day, that the reform of the health insurance system that the Democrats had brought about was actually just a nice way of saying that Obama was creating death squads to come kill your family. Death squads, death panels. You will die because Obama and the Democrats are coming to kill you. And they're going to start with the elderly. That was the Republican and conservative messaging and conservative media messaging in particular on health reform. And then it was time to vote again. And in history, of course, the first congressional election after a new president is elected, the pendulum almost, pendulum almost always swings back the other way against the party of the president. And with a, a victory as big and as sweeping as Obama and the Democrats had had 10 years ago tonight, Obama won in 2008 by eight and a half million votes. He more than doubled McCain in the Electoral College. Democrats had already had a majority in Congress before that election. They added another 21 seats that night. They went up to a supermajority in the Senate. When the, pub, when the pendulum had swung that far to the Democrats in 2008, followed by two incredibly hard years thereafter. And one of the biggest policy lifts ever with health reform. In 2010, that first midterm for Obama, the pendulum swung back very, very hard. Democrats didn't just lose the House that year, they lost 63 seats in the House. They lost six Senate seats. It was just brutal. But that shellacking didn't just emerge from the ether on election night itself on 2010. There were signs all through those first two Obama years that it was coming. Even though Obama was sworn in in January 2009 with a 67% approval rating, by the following month, by February 2009, there were little protests starting against him. Uh, and starting specifically against the stimulus bill that he got passed to try to stop the desperate and historic freefall of the U.S. economy. He was inaugurated January 20th. By February 16th, there were anti-Obama protests in Seattle, and then protests in Colorado, and then in Tampa, and Nashville, and Atlanta, and little pitiful protests in D.C. And at first, nobody called them the Tea Party, but by April, by tax day 2009, just three months into the new administration, that's what they were calling them, Tea Party protesters. By the summer of 2009, members of Congress were going home for the summer recess and they were doing town halls. Those town halls were all of a sudden filled with raging anti-Obamacare protesters. The whole political discussion in the country was about this resistance to the new administration. This movement that members of Congress were facing at home in their districts every time they popped their heads up about anything. This activist Tea Party movement was really fueled by the conservative media. It gave a ton of energy to the conservative wing of the Republican Party. It led to Republicans being primaried from the right. It also led to tons of Republican energy for that first midterm election in 2010. There is no exact mirror image of that movement this time around in 2018 as we sit here on the eve of the first congressional election of Barack Obama's successor as president. There is no left-wing Tea Party. 
because the left and the right are different. But shortly after the birth of the Trump administration, we also saw the birth of Indivisible, focused on pressuring members of Congress like the Tea Party did back in the early Obama days. Also, Swing Left, directing activist energy almost as soon as Trump was elected toward the House districts that would be most flippable in 2018, most flippable from Republican to Democrat. We got Run for Something, recruiting progressive candidates to run for office up and down the ballot, Senate and Congress all the way down to zoning board and dog catcher. We also got Flippable, which focuses on state government races to try to undo the gerrymandering Republicans did after 2010, which has given them an almost insurmountable structural advantage for keeping control of Congress. All of these groups and a bunch more were all founded by the time Donald Trump was inaugurated in January of last year. They were founded to mobilize and channel the energy of people opposed to this new president in a constructive direction toward concrete, achievable political aims. Now, as I say, the, the left and the right are not the same. You might have noticed. <laughs> and the Republicans really did get lucky as, a, luck, as lucky as a party can possibly get in the Senate map this year. The Republicans are only defending one Republican senator in a state that Hillary Clinton won, while Democrats are defending 10 Democratic senators from states that Trump won. You cannot get more lucky than that in terms of the Senate map. In addition to that, the Republicans really did successfully gerrymander the House so aggressively after that 2010 election that to win the House of Representatives this year, Democrats will have to win congressional votes by almost triple the margin that they would otherwise have to win by if that gerrymandering hadn't happened. We're going to have more on that coming up a little later on in the show tonight. But even with those factors in the Republicans' favor, tonight, on the eve of the midterm elections, to the extent that Democrats really do now have a chance of flipping the House of Representatives tomorrow, to the extent that Democrats are fighting to win that majority on such a wide field across so many districts that are currently held by Republicans, you really do need to look at what those activist groups have done. They got nowhere near the press that the Tea Party movement got in 2010. But look at the effect of those groups that formed after Trump's election. Just look, look at just Indivisible. We first talked about Indivisible on this show on January 4th of last year. So a couple of weeks before Trump's inauguration, before the women's marches, before any of that, we had noticed these very, very small protests cropping up. In fact, you might, even not call, you might not even call them protests, just constituents showing up at the offices of their Republican members of Congress uh, to voice their concerns, like these women who showed up at the office of Congressman Bob Goodlatte in Roanoke, Virginia. Other people turned up at Senator Cory Gardner's office in Colorado. Just ordinary citizens visiting their representatives, but they were being very deliberate about their strategy and about getting the word out about what they were doing. We started following that, and we quickly realized that they were following this new online guide, the Indivisible Guide, which was drawn up by some former Democratic congressional staffers you'd never heard of. And they were putting this document together to give people very practical advice about how to learn from the tactical success of the Tea Party under President Obama. It was detailed instructions about how to put effective pressure on your own member of Congress to block the Trump agenda. And again, this thing started just as a Google Doc online. But by January 4th, when we had one of the authors of that guide, Ezra Levin, on this show, remember, this is more than two weeks before Trump was even inaugurated, we learned that hundreds of these indivisible groups had sprouted up around the country and more were forming uh, literally as we spoke with Mr. Levin here on the show about it. Have you seen in terms of the direct response to this? Obviously, you've got this posted online, so you know how many people have downloaded it. You know how many people have read it. But are you seeing in terms of groups forming or other people using this work? Uh, it's phenomenal. i got to say, we've been blown away. We, we put up a Google Doc two and a half weeks ago. Google immediately crashed. We threw up a website just so people had a way to download it uh, and get the information. In the last two weeks that we've had that up, there have been over 600,000 page views. There have been 130,000 people who have downloaded the guide. But like you said, the really exciting thing is that there are all these groups 
groups spreading out all across the country and popping up. We've had in the last 24 hours since we've been collecting groups that are trying to resist Trump, 350 folks register. My phone- 350 buzz, groups? Groups, 350 groups all over the country. My phone buzzes every time a new one goes in and it's been vibrating since we've been talking. Every few minutes, more people are coming online and what they look like is what the indivisible Roanoke group looks like. They're in Milwaukee, they're in Florida, they're in New York, they're in California, they're in Pennsylvania. We've covered just about every single state and we have subscribers in literally every single congressional district in the country. That night here on this show, again, weeks before Trump was sworn in as president, there were 350 indivisible groups already formed around the country. By two days later, there were 1,500 indivisible groups around the country. Today, we called Ezra Levin for a check-in. He told us there are 6,000 indivisible groups around the country. And no, they don't get the press of the Tea Party, but boy, have they been working busily. And so, I mean, indivisible is notable just for that alone, right? They're broad spread across the country, being super practical, super focused, showing up at congressional offices and town halls everywhere relentlessly, particularly around Republican attempts to repeal Obamacare last year. And one result of that is that Indivisible actually appears to have engineered a whole bunch of Republican retirements from Congress. Members of Congress who looked out the window every day and decided they just didn't want to deal with this stuff from their own constituents. This is a local movement. People targeted only their own members of Congress. Indivisible groups, again, targeting only their own members of Congress. They held retirement parties outside Republican lawmakers' offices. They made them retirement cakes. I mean, one part of the reason Democrats have so much excitement about potentially winning the House tomorrow night is that, in fact, a whopping 40 Republicans who might have run for, for re-election instead decided they did not want to run again in this climate. 40. Would you? I say you'll retire, your situation's dire, we will soon replace you, never fear. Yes, we must report, now your time is short, I say you'll retire this year. Those are members of the Indivisible Group in California's uh, 49th District. They are all constituents of Congressman Darrell Issa, and that was them standing out in the rain this past January, serenading Congressman Darrell Issa, telling him, this year you're going to retire. They made him a uh, retirement cake. This is him. <laughs> Look, you'll wear a Hawaiian shirt. You'll be so happy in your retirement. And these guys held more than 50 weekly protests at Darrell Issa's offices. By the time you were sing they were singing there, they had already held more than 50 of them. These sort of deliberately cheerful, very jolly protests, even in the rain, doing everything they could with a smile on their faces to get Congressman Issa to please quit. And he did. Darrell Issa quit. He is not running for re-election this year. Here were members of that same indivisible group celebrating Darrell Issa's retirement earlier this year, as soon as he announced it with balloons and a cake and champagne. Sure, why not? Here are members of the indivisible group in Ohio's 12th district, high-fiving each other at their 38th straight weekly protest at Congressman Tat Pat Tiberi's office. Uh, the reason they are high-fiving there is because he announced his retirement. Uh, here's Daryl Issa's fellow California Republican, Ed Royce. He, Indivisible also targeted him with balloon-filled please retire parties, not very subtly suggesting that he too should retire. Ed Royce too is retiring. We saw this over and over again over the course of the last year, Republican members of Congress being relentlessly pushed and pressured, not by national movements that were getting featured on television all the time and that were on the cover of magazines, but being pressured by their own constituents who quietly organized to put pressure where they most could as individuals. Republican members of Congress being pressured by their own constituents to defy Trump, to explain themselves if they weren't, and to leave office if they couldn't. 40 House Republicans have opted not to run for re-election this year. And that has created a giant set of what had been Republican-held seats that are now open seats, which makes them obviously much riper for a Democratic flip because there's no, no incumbent there holding onto the seat with all of the power of incumbency to try to keep it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.